Okay. Let me see where we are. Here we go. So, uh, if you can't hear me, let me know. I, I had a little something in my voice, but if I project okay, it's preferable to the mic, I understand, because there's a hot spot here that it squeaks or something. Yes. Yeah. Right? So, uh, just let me know. So, yeah, I'm Art Moore. Yeah. No, I'm saying okay. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, I'm Art Moore, and uh, this is about Agile PMOs and Napoleon. Uh, actually, I, I plagiarized this, just so you know. This is from, uh, it started actually, at least from the book uh, Lean Enterprise, if you're familiar with that, where it actually is mentioned in there about Napoleon, if you missed that part. But I actually got interested in it when I read that piece about, well, what's that all about, right? So, but the instructive part of it, if we need to have some, some point to this all, right, is that um, I think it's instructive to, and you find out this more as you look into it, to look at the subject of PMO and, as it turns out, even Agile as a subject. <coughs> you get a perspective on it by stepping out of the software industry and seeing if the same concepts exist in another context. And that's informative. And the other thing that's actually I found interesting about that, as you'll see here, is that some of the things we think are very, very new are not so new um, at all. And uh, let alone Napoleon's involvement. Um, it's not something that you would think of when you think of Napoleon, I don't think. But, uh, or at least I didn't. But let me let the story begin there. So Napoleon, are you all familiar with the War of 1812 and Napoleon and that background? So he beat the Prussians, right, pretty badly before they caught up with him. And uh, here's how he did it, actually. He centralized, his, ar his army was actually centralized, but the execution was very decentralized, which... I found surprising about Napoleon. His orders, when he sent out orders to generals, they had two things in them and two things only. They had, what is it that I want you to do and why? That was what he put on his orders. I want this accomplished and here's why that should be accomplished. And how they did that was up to them within some certain constraints, right? And uh, it as you can see, promoted freedom, speed, adjustment, right? And the Prussians, on the other hand, very Germanic, very like, we're following orders, we're going to line up, and we're going to march across the field. And uh, he just kicked their butt in this battle. And uh, this approach actually became, Napoleon's approach actually became known as mission control years later. The Prussian approach was referred to as command and control. Okay? So this would be maybe just an interesting little factoid, except that uh, if you fast forward to just a few years ago, 2013, this is in a military journal, Today's Military. And I think you really have to pinch yourself when you read this to remind yourself you're reading a military journal, right? And it's talking about why mission control, why that Napoleon approach. And what they say exactly, they say that command and control and battle command are inadequate to describing what's happening today, first of all. And the mission control reinforces the imperative of trust and collaboration with myriad partners. And it enables leaders to the ability to anticipate and manage transitions, creates an environment of disciplined initiative. That could be like from an Agile magazine or an Agile article, right? Seeks adaptive teams capable of anticipating and managing transitions 
Transitions, I think, is their concept of change. And it acknowledges that they have to share risks. Risks must be shared. So I was astonished by this, actually. But more interesting, why this is in these, today's journal, this, uh, today, today's military, is that this approach has actually been adopted by the Marines. This is what the Marines are using to operate on now. It's also what NATO is using. And uh, special forces and a few other areas are operating, uh, moving on to this basis of operation. It's also true that except for you form a special group now that know that this came from Napoleon because if you look every place, the credit for this goes to the Prussians because after they got beat, they wrote it up. So Napoleon got forgot about it, right? Retrospective. It's a retrospective. It's a retrospective, right? Yeah, they didn't want that to happen again. So if you sum all that up, right? What are they, so they're describing that the way you command is with just objective and why. And within that construct, you provide disciplined initiative within some certain constraints. The words they use themselves are empowerment, collaboration, and trust. Good information flow, not so much, <laughs> but that's another point that comes up later, and so that it yields the ability to adapt. So I submit that that's an agile PMO. By the way, I, I failed to mention that, uh, which you, I'm sure, are all familiar with, is there are a lot of definitions of PMO about what it is, why it is, what it's doing. Um, common ones, right, that I've seen, at least in terms of taxonomies, are, although they're a, uh, a blend many times, are an enterprise PMO that uh, is in two flavors. There's one that handle standards, training, readiness for the organization, those kind of things. There's another enterprise one that manages the portfolio for the enterprise as a whole. Turns things on, turns things off. Manages value delivery of the portfolio. That's not the one I'm talking about. I'm not talking about either one of those in this presentation. But they, the same things apply. The one I'm going to be mostly referring to is the one that manages a set of, in safe terms, would be release trains or manages a set of projects all moving toward a particular outcome for a program. So I'm talking about a, a delivery program, OK? OK. So. So what does that mean if you translate that? So that's, that's what an Agile PMO is for the military, right? Very familiar concepts, right? Collaboration, trust. So if you were to map that, the question that comes up sometimes in the context of Agile is, well, where'd the PMO go? Uh, is it or isn't it? Uh, do I need it? Do I not need it? Um, if you look in the scaled Agile framework, you can infer like, oh, it might be there, and it has these capabilities. And you see threads about that. Uh, where's the PMO, and what is it doing? Um, and at a minimum, we can say this. We can say that it requires, if it's going to be there, it needs to facilitate close <coughs> collaboration horizontally across disciplines, like business, architects, analysts, and downward as well, right, to the projects. It's a communication facilitator. And this, um, also from that same book, actually, this, there's reference to this in the, uh, uh, the Lean Enterprise, that information flow reflects culture, and that cooperation and information flow both respond to trust. So I think that's really powerful because it means you can set a lot of things up, but unless you're driving through trust, 
you won't achieve information flow. So it's, it's not a soft thing that you need to, to foster. It's not going to work without that at any level. Um, I think the biggest one is that you start, right? You start a conversation. That's been my experience. That the, uh, you know, the agile point of documentation is, uh, is also because of lack of trust. So you're throwing things across a boundary. The other one I've seen is that um, it's out of pure necessity. That's the best motivator. That I, I've seen situations where everybody agrees things are a mess. And if you can identify the right enabler across them that they all agree is, a, is the problem, then they start to cooperate a little bit. But you have to build it a bit at a time. Thank you. Yeah. I wish I had a magic answer for you. <laughs> so do I. Yeah. Yeah. All right. This is one uh, article actually by uh, uh, Sanjeev Augustine, contributed this in Lightspeed, which you're probably mostly familiar with him, about what would that mean organizationally if we took those characteristics and tried to map them into the various vectors or perspectives of what a PMO might be, what would it mean potentially organizationally? And the take of uh, the Cutter Consortium and uh, Sanjeev was that you want to, in whatever layers you set up, have um, cross-pollination, where you have the, uh, if, you're, if you're having a steering committee, some of the members of the next level down are part of that steering committee, and vice versa. And in particular, if you have architects, some of those architects are participating in the projects, and uh, some of the projects are participating in architecture. You have representatives both ways. And uh, when I was doing some early research on this, I actually stumbled across an article by Leffingwell, actually, many years ago with some effort that he did where he actually promoted this model at that time as a workable model. He's, what they did was that the people who were the architects would actually then see the efforts going downstream, as opposed to having an architecture team that works up here, produces things, and then the projects take over. The people who are producing the architecture have a small team of key people. They then lead the efforts proceeding from that. And he promoted that as a workable model. It was, I think, six or seven years ago. So if you say, so that would be organizationally. That's one possibility organizationally. Another possibility, and these speak to some specific experiences I had. I don't know about you, but um, this is one of the biggest problems, is establishing whatever framework you're using, if you're using SAFE or whatever uh, construct you're using, is how do you know when you're done at the program level? And when does project work begin? Um, if you have a fully collaborative environment, that may take care of itself in terms of structure. But in my experience, this can be really exacerbated by not only organization structure, right? If you have teams like architecture, enterprise teams of architects, designers who have that duty, and also, if you have different layers of contractors, that's maybe the biggest one, actually, where you have, for example, a large program, and you're going to do the solution architecture for that program. And you're going to do a set of, however you craft them or, or describe them, a set of requirements or epics or features, however you describe that. If, uh, if you have one set of contractors doing that, and a different set of contractors then doing the next level down. Depending on how you construct your contracts, these people have no incentive 
to be done and do less. And when these people get it, they have an incentive to review all that and consider it, right? And you get tremendous, and there can be more than that. There can be actually three layers of contractors in some cases, or more, right? And that happens at every layer, depending on how you construct your contracts. So it's not that that couldn't work, but with a construct where you don't define the definition of done, that can occur. You can get situations where in an organization you look at their uh, formal templates for what's their program deliverable and then what's their project deliverable, and they're hard to tell apart, actually. And it's only by some on-the-ground necromancy that, you know, well, this goes here and that goes there. So that's one problem. So what that does, which I don't think you can see very well in this slide, is what I've seen happen, actually, is that because of that and some other things, like the fact that we, if you're typically risk-averse, and you want, as the program, and you say you have a complex set of initiatives that are very interdependent, the, the reasoning at the program level can be, well, I need to mitigate risk. And the way I mitigate risk is that I have to make sure that I drill down to discover all the key dependencies and the end-to-end -end flows so I don't miss anything across projects. And what occurs from that, it's seemingly, on the face of it, there's some value to that, is you have, if you staffed it in too much of a hurry, you have the projects waiting for a very long time, while the program really drills down practically to the delivery level for the individual projects. And just as we've seen with Agile versus Waterfall, what I've seen happen in those scenarios is that when the projects finally receive the product, it's not right. And they dive in, right? They have to then go back to the program and educate backward about what the actual situation is. Very expensive. Very, uh, very costly. And that's played out over and over again. So what that model actually is, is command and control. It's a program model of, well, if I'm a PMO, what I guess I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to control what's going on. So what I need to do is make sure that everybody's doing their job. You know, I'm, I need to make sure everything is, everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. I'm sort of like the cop, right, of the environment. Versus the servant leader approach at the program level where it facilitates, and it may, going back to the military model, it does purpose, uh, objectives, and purpose, and then handles collaboration among those teams as necessary to make sure that it helps them deliver on that promise. And that's where it ends. Um, if you look in the literature, actually, there, there is quite a bit in terms of um, references to the fact that the PMO is actually in a position today with regard to Agile as a concept <laughs> where it actually has to, because of this, reinspect what it's doing and its position in the organization at all. Uh, it's a non-trivial thing that it has to change from this mode of operation to one of value delivery. You know, I don't know of many places where they actually closely ask that question of, well, what value is the PMO delivering to me? What actual value am I getting from the PMO? Yes? So in this construct, is the program equivalent to the portfolio? Um, I don't think so. I, I have a slide on that later where I think that is a PMO. But it's a different kind of PMO that I'm speaking of here. The portfolio PMO, the way it's typically described that I've seen, is where you aren't, man you aren't involved with making sure these projects succeed. You're concerned with more from a Kanban approach and dependencies. 
what projects do I turn off, what projects do I turn on to manage my portfolio? Okay. Okay. So one thing that even at the program level though you could do is also help manage flow. One, if you just take that general concept of, well, if you change the PMO to, all right, I'm the facilitator of communication, right? Going back to information flow, the other thing that Napoleon needed was very good information flow. And even if you're all willing to collaborate very well, you need very good information flow. And you can use some help with that in terms of rolling things up, just the mechanics of it, making sure that major dependencies are tracked and visible and transparent to everybody. It's an activity. And priorities are reviewed. This is just uh, a personal opinion that I have that I thought I would share with you. Since I get to speak, I give you my opinion. Um, I think you have to be careful with schemes that, uh, in terms of how you organize a, s a set of projects or uh, release trains or, or value streams, right? And you want to be synchronizing on a regular basis. That's one of the themes, right? You want to be synchronizing repeatedly and frequently so you can keep things uh, integrated and don't start to wander from each other. That's great. The risk that you have to watch out for is that in thinking that way, you don't start to turn it around again to being the program telling you exactly what you're supposed to produce every two weeks, right? Um, I, I saw something recently. You may have seen it, uh, Jeff Sutherland talking about uh, large-scale implementations, and he talked about what I thought was an interesting scale of innovation versus uh, structure for large-scale Agile, where on the structured side where you want to, you, you need predictability, you would put in like safe, scaled Agile framework. And he referenced Spotify as the ideal example on the total other end of innovation, where they would, uh, in terms of you put out at the high level some uh, high level objectives, what your strategy is, and the teams at Spotify actually sign up for them. You don't even say what you expect teams to do. They sort of like, it's a backlog and they pick what they want to do on a regular basis. That's the other extreme, right? But I've seen this concept be turned around to actually potentially, if not done right, make that whole extreme waterfall method from the program worse. Because you're not only doing waterfall then once every six months or once every year, you're doing extreme waterfall once every two weeks. You know? You want to be taken out of that pain. So that's just another slide showing that example. And this is the, the reverse of that where uh, it's not that you couldn't and wouldn't want to set up a possibility of synchronizing at the end of every iteration, but you want to run toward your, at the program level, you want to run toward a longer range goal, as opposed to uh, micromanaging what the goal is for each of those teams by sprint, right? You have your goal that's, that's X number of iterations, the major goal, as it should be. What you're there to do is to help the projects slice that up, manage their dependencies to make the run toward that goal. I think that's a better model for that reason. Otherwise, you could end up being uh, not in love with your job. This is what uh, the question about earlier about a portfolio, right? Yeah, the portfolio is really around, when you see that discussed, the portfolio approach to lean portfolio PMOs is more focused on not execution like Scrum, but lean, Kanban. How's my flow going? How's my uh, resource utilization going? How's my performance? How's my value delivery 
as an entire organization? And what do I need to turn on and turn off or pause or restart to keep that value stream going at its optimum rate? So that's another model. So if you sum up all those things about what this kind of execution or program level or uh, delivery type PMO does, it really comes out to be almost like uh, the scrum master for those, these guys, right? In a way. Well, I take that back. It's sort of like that. Somebody told me that when I presented this elsewhere. It made sense to me then, but let me see. So it sets the direction, right? Whether it's the PMO himself or they're representing the business, or the, those business stakeholders are part of it. They are giving the objectives and the purpose just as uh, Napoleon did. And they want to enable information flow. Major, major factor. And they want to facilitate these guys in terms of dependencies, risks, taking away barriers, and provide that transparency with those tool sets, metrics, and of course, there's some standards compliance that goes with this. So as this is saying, this is one, oops, excuse me, one major piece on it. Uh, one piece of literature is, is asserting this, that uh, the, the PMOs, contrary to what many of them have been doing so far, they need to back out of a lot of conversations that they're in. They don't need to be in every conversation. They need to be helping these projects get on with it. Uh, rather than, if you think of it, if you think of that simplicity, it's in a way, it's simple application of trust, right, as an agile principle. I'm trusting you to get the work done. I'm not there to make sure you're doing the work. I'm there to, to get things out of the way so you can get the work done. Completely different perspective. You can see that upper management uh, would feel a little uh, disenfranchised by being disconnected from the voting power, I guess, that uh, I think is what he said. Hold on. Yeah, just not liking that they are now being stripped away from a, a say or a vote to the more specific tactical type project day-to-day -day work, right? That was one of your, they have to step away from that, right? Right. What, what, do you have a comment on that? I would agree, but I would, I would say that uh, it's really it's the same problem, it's the same project problem rolled up to the program, right? It's that just like you don't like stepping away from managing everything about your team on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure they're getting things done, you have to be able to step away from projects and allow them to get the work done. What, what I've seen in terms of uh, productivity is the reverse model, right? Where you, you actually do do that and you keep close control over what's going on. My, my subjective evaluation of that situation on a large scale with one particular effort was the morale was very, very, very low because two things happened, just like what we, the scenario we painted out. Number one, they wait a long time to get told what they're supposed to do because the program is drilling down. And typically things get staffed up too early when that happens. So they're waiting. And then sometimes they'll just get on with it anyway. And then things start to get out of sync. Then they have the uh, situation of when they're finally, and they try to get ahead by anticipating some things, they get told what to do. Now, what I'm saying here is kind of painting it in the extreme, right, just for effect, but it's not entirely not the case, is that then what happens is they get, finally, here's what you're supposed to do. And they happen to know it's not quite right because they're on the ground and they've been actually been already working on it now. So now not only do they have to get the work done, they have to pause, they have to get it sorted out with someone who told them what to do, that they understand it better than they do, and it can be a really unpleasant experience. So, you know, everybody wins if you can get away from that. But I, I do understand that it goes back to the other gentleman's question about trust, right? You got to incrementally break out of that, 
behavior pattern in order to get the value stream starting to turn up for you. Yes. The previous slide? I think that's a good question. Can you restate it? I think it might be. Did you guys hear all of them? No. Yeah, why don't you say it? Because you're going to say it better than I do. I'm absolutely certain of that. Um, I'll, I'll give my opinion, which I think I don't have a lot of personal experience with this. I'll give an opinion anybody else can give theirs. Um, I think there's two ways to look at it. One is that uh, this kind of portfolio that we were just talking about, about managing the overall portfolio for the organization. In an organization that's pushing out a lot of different products would be monitoring the situation one level above that where you might have some product owners that they have some projects going they have some work going that you're monitoring that's not producing anything you have some that are producing great right producing some great revenue for you and you're watching all those across your whole portfolio and their contribution to each other and their dependencies on each other which ones are jamming the flow which ones are facilitating the flow, which ones are getting more throughput, and balancing which products you're going to come down on, which ones you're going to continue. So it would be one level above. The, the other would be if um, you have, once you, you delegate something to a product owner, I would agree that that product owner needs to be able to run their show in their area. I'm not sure if that addressed your question, but. Yeah, somewhat. I, you know, I wasn't expecting a right or wrong answer. I was yeah. more looking for your experience with your team as well or what other companies are doing. That's helpful. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Picking up on your mention of uh, being an enterprise book, would the role of the PMO in this case also be to sort of manage across the different uh, horizons to make sure that you know the, the further out, more innovative, um, products that would get lost if you go strictly by ROI or current market position or things like that get an appropriate representation in the flow of, of product development? That's a good question. Uh, my opinion about that one would be that they get a facilitator of information flow to enable those decisions. I don't, I don't think they're the, the resident place where those decisions are made. I think they're a facilitator in that way in a junior role actually to senior management. I, I, that's why I would see it. Anybody else? Okay, so there is one other dimension I wanted to go into. Oh, first of all, yeah. So we've really covered this, is that those things that you need to put this into a particular environment where none of this is in place, in my experience, has been you have to have the tools to make this happen. You have to have training. But mostly the same message once again, right? You have to have the right mindset. This, but I bring it up here because this is an interesting twist on it. And I think this, again, is from the lean enterprise, I'm not sure, yeah, yeah, this, this fellow uh, was 
studying safety, there were, there were a lot of accidents occurring. And uh, so he was doing this major study on safety. And in the process of doing that, he came up with these observations about information flow in organization and culture. And uh, he's the one who said in the earlier, I, I mentioned that thing about uh, culture is what monitors information flow and is based on trust. Trust Through trust, you get information flow. So he says that there, he said that there were three kinds of cultures. There were pathological, bureaucratic, and generative, based on, based on observations. He did actually a lot of uh, case studies. He said a pathological organization was low cooperation, messengers pre presenting problems were shot, there was uh, shirking of responsibility, bridging from one area to another, talking to, talking to somebody about what they're doing is discouraged, failure leads to scapegoating with somebody else, and novelty is crushed. So that's pathological. And in between the bureaucratic is that there's some modest cooperation, you neglect the messengers, near, very narrow responsibilities, some bridging is tolerated, and failure leads to very heavy justice, and novelty is concerned, considered to be a problem. And the interesting thing as you go about this, you can see as he, as he was deriving these, he's looking really at information <coughs> flow, is what he came out of with this, is that in a pathological organization, you have no information flow, zero. In a bureaucratic information flow uh, organization, you start to get some flow of information. Maybe not a lot, but because of the culture, you're not going to get information flow. And what you need to get information flow is you need a generative organization where you have cooperation, you have sharing of risks, and you have the fact that failure leads to inquiry and novelty uh, is, of course, implemented. So that's the reason, in a way, that information come flow, the discussion of it comes last here, is that it's all those other things that Napoleon had that actually enabled him to have information flow also. So although the other guys were heavily structured, their, their information flow, based on this, was probably much, much worse. They had much, a much worse idea of what was going on because they were probably a pathological or bureaucratic organization. Whereas he had a very you know, simple approach of purpose, objective, and purpose. And through that, he probably got great information flow. It's almost counterintuitive, but when you think about it, 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 it ends up making sense. How many of us are deal with pathological type or organizations? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I left one. How do you help? You said they need the right mindset. Like, what's some tips, tricks of, uh, tricks is a bad word, but what are the tips to help them? Because it's in it for them to have the right information coming to them versus no information coming to them because no one wants to say anything because they're getting shot. How do you move that mindset? to one of the generative mindset. Yeah, the, the, tip, the tricky thing to answer that is, well, one part is that in a government situation, I guess I'd just be frank, right? In a government situation, success is not necessarily always the parameter that's being judged in terms of the value you produce, right? So that's a major problem to get over all by itself, to get a culture where you get oriented around production of value. So you got to even start lower than that in a way, you know? To, I mean, because they have to perceive they have a problem by that, right? But even, th so you get over that, what I've seen is that in one very large case, uh, very government, very conservative, is with Agile coming on, right? Everybody kind of wants to do Agile because it's, cool, if nothing else. It's like, well, yeah, let's do Agile. That's, it's fantastic. So you have 
all these individual divisions doing agile, right? But they aren't talking to each other at all. Uh, I have an extreme case, for example, is that uh, you had the development organization and you had the business users where when they implemented Agile, the, uh, the development organization said, well, we, we need even more of your requirements bound tightly up front because we need that locked down so that we can sprint on them. Right? Uh, so, you know, they're, they're sprinting, but they're demanding much more waterfall on the front end. And if something came out in the sprint that they didn't like, there wasn't like, well, come talk to us about it. Well, well that's not going to work. Then that has to go out and go into change control. And, you know, we'll see about that sometime down the road. Um, and you have uh, competing people thinking they're the, the evangelist leading Agile, right? But they're actually not talking to each other. So what we did in that, the only reason I bring that up is that what we did in that example is because some of these people are, are very well intended, you know? You don't have to print a black picture. Some of these people are really trying to get this right and do it well, but they can't cross the boundaries. They can't make it work, right? From operations to testing to uh, uh, enterprise architecture to system design, system engineering, you know? They're all trying to do something, but they're they're really frustrated with each other because they can't get the other guy to do what they want to do, is we actually just described that problem, captured it, presented it to each one of the major stakeholders, and they had reached the point of frustration. That was what I was talking about, about going back to trust, you know? They had reached a point of frustration where that problem was all real to all of them. And we said, you know, obviously, we need to change this situation. And it's starting to create a coalition of people at the division level to address those barriers and getting, more importantly, maybe the top-down mandate that we can't actually do it organically. We have to do it to address the major boundaries because that's where the holdups end up being. Yes, sir. So how big a barrier is the contracting system that we have today? Is there a vehicle that you found that actually can allow for this kind of interaction? Or is there a new vehicle like on the horizon that's going to need to be created? I can only tell you something that I read about this. I don't have, I know what needs to be done. I have my opinion of that, right, in terms of the regs. But I, it was shown to me by someone that according to the FAR, this is the assertion. I, I can't substantiate this. According to the FAR, it's achievable with the FAR as it exists today, the, the Federal Acquisition Regulations, right? That if someone, it goes back to intent. And again, I'm just repeating this. I can't vouch for it, right? But it goes back to intent. If you have the intent, you can make the FAR work for you. That's what I've been told. I, I, yes, sir? Just to piggyback off that, there is something called a tech FAR. Yes. It's kind of like FAR 2.0, which embraces a lot more FAR can be very prescriptive and, and sort of make you try to be waterfally. Yeah. <laughs> even though it doesn't say it, uh, the tech FAR is much more progressive. Okay. Yeah. And I'll even chime in. I think I say this just about every other meetup, but uh, the Mark Schwartz, CIO at USCIS at DHS, uh, Department of Homeland Security, United States uh, Citizenship and Immigration Service, which that was Customs. Citizenship, yeah. Citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, we are lucky enough to have two teams right now, we're looking to, I think, go to three teams, that they have a system set up to where they hire basically contract teams, and in that, they are saying that you must deliver something of working tested software state every single two weeks. You must work with our other stakeholders. Bridging is encouraged. Risks are shared. I can almost see a lot of that stuff in those contracts where Mark Schwartz can go, I'm gonna give out four contracts, two teams, for each of these contracts six months from now, I'm gonna check in with each of these teams. If you're doing a good job, I might add a team. If you're not doing so good, I'm gonna drop you down to the one team. That's a new vehicle, at least. I don't know what the technical details. I can certainly put you in contact with our federal side. 
um, to kind of talk through some of that stuff. But that is definitely a contract vehicle that they are now putting in place to where it is more, I think, leaning towards that generative side and less of the, certainly the, the pathological side that we've had for many years for contracting that um, you hide a lot of stuff. Yeah. And you try to cover your ass. Yeah. Uh, so, in anyway, fact, yeah, come see me afterwards and yeah, see you But I think that has a lot to do as well with um, them moving away from doing that command and control where they try to predefine every last aspect of the scope. And instead say, I think in that particular vehicle, they don't even say, well, at very high level, maybe they're saying, well, this is our goal, we need to replace this you know, system, we need to modernize this process, but they leave the scope fairly open, which I think is a, is a, key, a, a key part. And um, I think that's the part that needs to be encouraged everywhere that they stop you know, fixating so much on, on defining scope just so that later on they can say, you did or did not do that. Especially since if you don't do it, there's no penalties anyway. I mean, we all know how many programs went bad and the contractors got paid anyway. So I yeah. don't understand what the purpose of that is in the first place. Yeah. yeah, I'm yeah, glad you. A, that's the major distinction too: is that scope is not. It's we don't know what we want. We have a fuzzy idea, but we're ridiculous to think that we can know exactly what we want because it is. We're all still building mostly software, and <coughs> it's hard to know what you really want until you actually are seeing the product. Right. You said the budget. I mean, if the scope is out there, then how do you allocate the funds to the contractors or the role in the So, I mean, they're, they're staffing eight teams. Okay. Uh, each of those costs, I don't know, a million dollars each. Um, so, that's what they're looking at. Here's our high priorities. We know kind of what we want. We don't want a new immigration form or something that needs to be out on the USCIS uh, website. That gets a pot of money, and then I think they go off, and at six months from now, they can say, it looks like, based on the roadmap, we're going to get this done in the next year. Let's keep funding that project. Let's look at this one. Six months into it, we're not even close to getting done with that. Can that thing go to something else? Is I think the way it kind of works. So the yeah. thing they need to come around to is they've reduced their risk horizon. Mm -hmm. They've actually yeah. shrunk down their, you know, their exposure. And if you get somebody high enough up who's sponsoring you, then let I just worried what happens when the next secretary and the next CIO comes in. Yeah. But but it sounds like there is a you know there are some points of light. Mm -hmm. I, I know there have been uh, some major new issues being drafted by OMB for review. I, I've seen one or two of them uh, coming down with you and the federal government are going to be doing agile. Very bold and encouraging actually. And in the case of uh, Mark Schwartz at USCIS, his, his, which you probably know better than me, Brian, but they call their methodology the acquisition life cycle because it starts with acquisition. And to his point, we actually had a conversation with, with Mark not long ago that on that point of scope, right, what they have is something called a value registry, right? So. They fund, I think the typical model was for six months, maybe three, three months in the contract. And they, they maintain a value registry. So they don't, when they, that period of time is done, they don't look at, did you, did you deliver all those things I asked you to? They don't even ask that question. All they ask is, well, let me look at how much value you delivered in that time. Because they know the whole situation the requirements can change, right? So they're monitoring based on some metric. I, I couldn't give you too off the top of my head how they do that, but it's I'm just watching how much value you're delivering. If you're delivering value to me, I'm going to keep you going. Well, I guess that goes to my point. <clears throat> I was going to ask if you had any thoughts about how this agile PMO, idealized agile PMO, would fit into the larger entity or enterprise uh, <clears throat> need to, to do periodic reporting. Because as a former controller for a large financial, uh, things might be very generative for some period of time. But then when you hit the quarter boundaries, it becomes completely command and control to try to hit the, you know, the unitized numbers. Yeah. And usually that stop doing this, stop doing that, you know, because this is what we promised to the city of Wall Street. I guess what I would answer to that would be that. Um Everything we've just talked about remains true, that 
the illusion is that you have that in the other method when you don't. And well, you can stop cutting checks. You can stop, yeah, but the illusion of keeping good track of what's going on is not there. Actually, this approach, whatever it is they're producing, you're going to find out about it sooner. Yeah, and you're going to. I just want to clarify my question. Oh, excuse me. Because, because it was not really about the optimal method of development. Yeah. It was just the broader need of a service agency or a product house <clears throat> to, to manage its periodic reporting. Oh, I got you, yeah. You know, because they, they just won't allow random fluctuations of measured external. Yeah, I think the same point still does apply, though, because here you'll get those measurements more frequently. And if you had a portfolio PMO that those measurements rolled up to, you'd have a closer thumb on things at a more regular pace, I would think. So they would take an active role in trying to make adjustments? I would think so, yeah. Sure. Sir? Yeah, essentially, that's exactly what they'd be looking at. Instead of doing traditional planning, strategic planning, they're going to have to go ahead and be very agile about it. And what they're going to be looking at is what you said, value, on a regular basis. And rather than funding, OK, a project for the whole year, Okay, they could very well do it by quarters, and based on the value. And and uh, Brian, Brian brought up a good example that okay, they can go ahead and terminate it instead of continuing to waste money, and go ahead and put it elsewhere. And this will go ahead and prevent that fourth quarter belt tightening exercise that goes on in commercial world as well as the government, if not eliminated, at least mitigated to a greater degree. Right. I think you could argue that to some degree your budgeting actually becomes much more predictable because what you're in essence doing is you're buying a certain amount of development capability rather than you're buying an, an output. You're not saying you're going to give me this program or project or software or system down to you know the last specification. You're telling me you're giving me this development capability, two teams with you know eight people, this mix of people, this level of experience, and what we make out of that is up to us, but if we run it right, we get the maximum value back for the amount of budget we've allocated, which is really that whole idea of turning that iron triangle kind of on its head and saying we, you know, we have a certain amount of money to spend and we have a certain amount of time and scope, we just focus on getting whatever is most valuable rather than saying this, whether it's still relevant or not. Sure. Just a question then. So I hear a lot of discussion of the word value. So can somebody help me define what value is in this particular case? You want to give a shot? Excuse me, Bob. I, 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 I would say it's, it's an example. Right? One of the, one of the issues that we, uh, that we constantly deal with is, okay, with software apps. You know, what's the percentage? Okay, if you go ahead and say, take something like Word or Excel, okay, how much capability what percentage of the total capability of, say, Excel does the average user use? What you're really looking at in terms of value is, okay, does this value, okay, serve a large percentage? Answer, uh, answer the value for a large percentage or a small, small percentage, and then go ahead and prioritize on maximizing value to a larger percentage. About my bean counter answer would be, you're going to try to do some sort of marginal analysis and compare what you're putting in to what you're getting out. So if you're getting a delta on your revenues or delta on your cost in a downward direction. And that's where I think it's tricky because if you can't get those estimates right, that's when the command and control seems to snap in right. to, to fill those gaps quarterly. It seems like the commander's intent and then the program definition of done, that becomes elevated. There has to be a lot of rigor and a lot of buy-in around that concept, and then it will all work. And if not, then it just won't work. Well, I think it's a challenge for everybody, but, but there, there's always going to be some independent variables, right? So like your revenue, if you're taking in revenue, things can impact your revenue stream or your forecast. So most financials are expressed as of differentials between uh, revenue and expense. Sir. So in, in the analogy or in the example you're using in the portfolio, it, it seems like 
there's a like the, the discussion of values. Well, on what level do you define what and why? I mean, we could start at the what is win the war so we can survive as a nation, or you can get down and you can say secure this area for this reason. And it's still, it just become, it becomes another definition of scope um, as far as where, so to comment on that, because I'm, I'm trying to picture how we justify, you know, maybe it's me making the transformation in my mind, yeah. but how we do our budgeting exercise and how we defend our budget each year without, define, without, you know, it's going to, you've got to set what you're going to do at some level, you know, you've got to, you're going to say, I'm going to replace the, ERP system, or I'm going to uh, replace the recruiting functionality, or whatever it is that, that you're doing, you, you can't, you know, I don't think they'll just go for, I'm going to make things better and have eight teams. Um, so, so, and I'm not saying it doesn't be. Yeah, there's, there's, there's more to it. Know, but the, yeah, I know yeah, yeah. No, yeah, no, I, I understand. I hope maybe we can have a little a discussion. Yeah, yeah, you know, I think, like with the, uh, uh, well, with what I understand of the uh, USCIS approach, and uh, even the scale algebra framework, you know, some people don't like it, but it has some pieces to it that are pretty good. Um, is you also set some objectives in the beginning. You define those objectives, and even though they do the value registry approach at USCIS, they do define some objectives, some scoping things that they expect to have happen. They don't not do that, right? And you evaluate value. The trick, of course, comes in to evaluate how well did I achieve those, right? I, my own opinion about, I'm not there on the ground doing some of these with them. Um, so there's somebody from Excel who can speak to this, that's great. But what I can say is that what I like about that approach is that it does do away with the illusion that if I can get a test case that checked off for these 3,000 requirements that we're all good, you know, that that proves that we're, we delivered some value. This is more to the point, right? It may be more subjective. It may be somebody evaluating you against something that they viewed against these five things you're supposed to accomplish according to the product owners, but it's not that that's not happening. Yeah, I think the, I, you know, I need to get more into the understanding of what our projects are doing, but yeah. the way I certainly hear when we have sort of these monthly check-ins at the, at, the, at the company level is that they're looking at sort of from an impact driven development standpoint and that we expect X percent increase in immigration forms get submitted unless people turn away because they're playing with this clunky old system. Mm -hmm. When we actually get that new system in place, it should have this percentage of people staying on the site, um, more applications submitted, more pro more processed. Those are the kinds of things that are, I think they're setting as those high-level milestones and goals. And then they, they can check in in six months and say, okay, we've got all this data coming in. Just like Amazon, when they're figuring out what their next widget is to make, they're looking at all the data coming in that says, yep, we're actually having more conversions to buying our products. Um, that's Amazon's way. They have a lot of data. But I think we, we definitely have public-facing government websites get a lot of traffic that we can start to look at healthcare.gov and go, well, we're getting a lot more registered now that we can actually allow people to log in. Right. <laughs> right? Sure. Yeah. So uh, right now we're working with the executive <coughs> residents to actually reform the way government contracting works and to promote agile values. And one of the things that we're focused on is metrics throughout the process, whether it's you know our core development metrics like you know static analysis type of things that are very low level code kind of thing, versus also at the high level, things like conversion rates, which is what you're talking about, um, bounce rates, things like that, that you have to, <clears throat> you know, Twitter mentions sentiment analysis on social media, things like that that sort of tell you that you have uh, succeeded. And you mentioned, uh, you know, you wanna do better than you put in. Those kinds of things are what we're trying to promote. And it all comes down to metrics. You have to measure every right. automation everywhere to get these metrics to generate enough data to actually do some more analysis. And if you have those metrics, you're at the beginning of deciding whether you've gotten value or not. Yeah. It, it, you know, a simple scenario, not that it's all like this, but to go back to your point about, well, how do I tell, you know, is, well, what if in the middle of 
this major initiative where you're supposed to produce X, right? You discover that um, I need Y before I can do that. Mm -hmm. It's a big piece of work, right? Um, you don't, at the very least, you don't want your model constrained to be that the contractor is going to do his best to work around that X because that Y because he's contracted to produce X. So by God, he's going to produce an X. You know, it may not be very good. It may not be really what you want, but he'll get that done, right? Versus you you solve the Y. Somebody has to evaluate that change of direction and assign that value at that time, right? That there's you have to recognize that value. However, that happens with your metric. Somebody has to assign that value and be able to adjust their expectation at that point. That's what the other approach doesn't allow you, I don't think. I'll make a note that came in on the uh, chat channel, but uh, GSA is also in a similar contracting situation as USCIS. Oh. Zach, I can't remember his last name, chimed in. So, build it, yeah, and I know VA, I think, maybe? The EA has been doing some very good stuff. They're doing great work in the yeah. agile space, but I don't know if their contracting is heading in that way. I, uh, I work with the FBI, and they're doing certain sections are changing the way they do things so that they can support a more agile framework within whatever bounds they have for contracting. So being able to support an entire section instead of just one project, things like that. Sure. Um, to the question of the gentleman over there earlier, um, I mean, we all know that, that budget forecasts are notoriously inaccurate. I mean, we're basically guessing at what it's going to cost at the time that we know the least about what we're actually going to do. So I, I uh, in the uh, impact mapping book by Goiko Atchich, uh, he has a really interesting approach where he says, instead of saying, what is this going to cost, you turn around and ask, what are you willing to invest to achieve this goal? And by the way, what is your goal actually? You know, what measurable improvement do you want to have? And what are you willing to invest in that? Um, and that's that way the leadership can actually say, this is how much money we're willing to put into this right now, rather than getting some estimate that somebody in essence makes up that usually gets overrun by 300, 500 percent, whatever. And the promise is using an approach like this that you deliver the most value you can deliver for that kind of money. And hopefully that will get you to whatever measure metric you set for your goal. And if not, at least you know how close you are and how much more you're going to need when you reiterate on that. Or maybe you need less, and then you can actually stop before you've burned all of that money. So you turn it from a, a cost center into an investment decision, which in some ways is more realistic, because in many cases you just don't know. One more question. Yes, we'll, ma'am. We'll Real quickly, um, I, we got into the uh, interesting branch of discussion about procurement affecting the mindset um, matrix you have there. But getting back to that just in general, if at the leadership, if you're in a pathological sort of part <laughs> side of the chart, what kind of techniques have you seen used or have you seen a transformational experience where a, a context went from pathological to generative successfully? Is that a self-assessment process followed up by trying to change, or mm. how do you do that? I might be able to change that into a segue, actually, to my last slide. Yeah. <laughs> that might work. Speak. Glad you asked that. Yeah. Let me try it anyway. You know, we have a parking lot item of contracting. OK. Yeah. Ah, there you go. Yeah. So. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the Cotter change model? Uh, a number of people. So um, this model was, you see it popping up a lot these days in agile presentations, which I think is great. But it's very readable. It's a very small, simple book. You know, it's one of those ones where you, you read it and you go like, well, of course, you know, that makes sense. And yet it was written by a, a Harvard guy. and. Uh, it was voted, I don't know, by the Wall Street Journal or someplace like that, as one of the top, uh, one of the 25 most influential business books of the 20th century. It was written in 1995, I think. So it's pretty good. Uh, I, I strongly recommend it. He, uh, he surveyed well over 100 major change initiatives 
in major organizations, right? And looked at, well, why did they win? Which ones worked and which ones didn't? So I think I can speak more to that generic situation than I can to, well, if I have a particular pathological behavior, how do I fix that? Because I think the first thing to fix it is the first thing in the Cotter change model, which is people's sense of urgency has to be raised, that there is something that has to be done. If that doesn't happen, change is not going to occur. And the first three things that I, I, my favorite part about the model actually is, he says the first three things are the things that are most often neglected. And he talks about these having to be done in sequence, actually. That initiatives that fail, and it's very common for them to fail for these reasons, is there was never a real compelling sense of urgency established that something had to happen before he began. And then second, you didn't build a collaboration. You didn't build a coalition team, right? You, you might, one of the best, he describes it actually, one of the best ways to kill something is to uh, get all the executives together. They say, that's great. We absolutely have to do that. Let's assign Joe to it. Joe, go ahead and take care of that, right? And then they all forget about it. And uh, there's two years of his career ruined, right? Because he's just left to take care of this thing. And there's no buy-in to it. You, ha you have to get a few of the key players in the organization strongly coalescing around this point. Because they, they have to stand the distance together. And you have to get a, uh, a really good elevator speech. It's funny that he says that in these, all these key ones, but that's one of the key ones. You have to have something that communicates simply. You can't, and he gives examples about this. You can't have, well, this is how we're going to address that pathological behavior, right? Or whatever it is, in a 100 page document. Just that alone is going to cause it to fail. It has to be simple, compelling, and then the last part that dovetails on that is that it has to be communicated over and over and over and over and over and over about 25 to 100 times more than you think you should. The place where it fails there is you communicate it out and you think you've done something, now you're going to get on with it, and you forget the communication part. And it has to be done repetitively until it just becomes part of the expectation of things. It actually leads to the very end where it becomes part of the culture. So I would start there. I would start with you have to get those things to happen. Otherwise, any techniques you apply, that you don't have the grounding to make anything stick. How do I do to say, wait a minute? Did that work? OK. Thank you. Just, just a quick, uh, Cotter has a book out, uh, more recent, Accelerate, XLR8. Oh, yeah? And it has to deal with bringing it into larger organizations. And so I would probably even start there versus this one, because it, it keeps these steps in, but it talks about bringing it into larger organizations. Oh, great. Yeah, Cotter also wrote a book called Buy-In. Yes, good writer. OK. So this is just from Forrester, just to end with uh, the fact that this is being talked about. The assertion that this Agile's not going away, and that what we're talking about here is the case in, in general uh, conversation about PMOs, that they do have to change dramatically. The way they operate today is not sustainable in an agile context. And that they have to shift basically by the common sense approach to applying the agile principles at the program level. It really, if you think about it, boils down to that. And in terms of the other piece of the mindset is moving from command and control to mission control or from being the cop to facilitating success, right? That's my take. I think that's the end. Just some references, too, if you want to look at those. 
Okay, are we, uh, any questions or are we wrapping up? Yes, sir. Okay. I have, I have an answer to that. Okay, great. The PMO should be working itself out of the job and looking at the next problem situation to be working on. It shouldn't necessarily have to be staying with each project in the team. It's almost like an organizational tool and a servant, um, instead of a servant leader, I'd say a servant partner, where you're actually, you, you have a PMO person who comes to the team to help them organize, because a lot of the time, teams don't know how to organize. They don't know how to get into I don't know how to get things done. So PMO is, is in my in my un understanding of the way we're doing it, is we're almost like agile coaches. We're coming to a team and helping them do stuff. If, and, and once they can get their leggings and they can do it on their own, we pull back and we go on to something else. We're too thinly staffed to be able to have one person with each team. So it's more like, for us, our agile PMO is more like I, yeah, and I would just add, that's great, I think. I, I would add just two things to that. One is that I would agree with you on this point, first of all, is that just take the word PMO and throw it out because it has so much baggage associated with it. You're sort of like dead on arrival by talking about that subject in a way. So if you take that and just put that on the side, right, what, what, what do we need to talk about? Well, we do need something to facilitate information flow, to help these guys coordinate. Very important. You also do need somebody saying something about what's the direction we should be going in, right? And um, what's the purpose of that? And, and setting that, those objectives. I think that the, the organization doesn't amorphously just like, let's go do some work, right? That, that has to exist somewhere, leadership. Um, beyond that, the, the, the example of Spotify, as I understand it, taking those stated objectives and just groups signing up for them, I'm enthralled by that. I, I have not seen that in operation, but it's an interesting concept to me. If that would work, that would work. The, the only thing that would be left then would be facilitating but communication. How would you promote that? I, I see no connection between, you know, Yeah, uh, I think those functions of information flow, if they happen uh, uh, organically, if that can happen, I, I'm okay with that. Um, I just know it has to happen. 
Yeah, I'm not. To, I'm believe me. I'm not to defend PMOs. That's not the purpose of my. They they have to, uh, but they it's these things that have to occur. That's the key point, right? You have to deliver where you want to be headed, so that, and you have to provide the structure so people can get there. Sure. Um, I would sort of challenge you on that and ask you to define a function that the PMO does that is not also done in a natural project. And I'll tell you to be careful because think about it. The project manager in the traditional PMI sense has no place in a natural project. But everything a project manager will do still gets done. It's just redistributed. So think about it. What work that the PMO does, <coughs> what of that doesn't get done in the natural project? It's all done. You're responsible. Well, I think you're, you're why are you trying to equate PMO to PMI? Why are you trying to do that? Well, because in, right, no, well, I'm not, why are you trying to equate that to PMO to PMI? That's my. Why do you want to do that? So, so because they PMI push the standard. One of the first organizations that defined PMO, and nobody really has a good definition. Like, um, you know, the presenter said, nobody really has a good understanding of what uh, PMO really is, because there's several levels of PMO. There's a tactical PMO, there's a strategic PMO, and there's operational PMO. And so, so the, the, the problem that everyone is facing, you know, it, is trying to kind of categorize, um, you know, what that PMO really does, and then they kind of just adjust to the, uh, the definition that is produced within whatever context. And then they just sort of maintain it, but um, and you know for for portfolio management, you know a couple a couple of decades ago, totally I think it used to work pretty okay because you needed standards, you needed sort of like you know uh, this one body that guided um, a, a number of projects and, and programs through. But what I'm trying to to ask, you know, and you know I, if someone has seen a successful life of your mom, please speak up. But I, I have not seen any major value that comes from PMO in a real, true, agile environment. Because it's all based on status reports, it's, it's all based on command and control, like you said, unfortunately right. so. Right. It's got the word sure. management in it. Right. So that's a problem <laughs> yes. in right. itself. Right. Right. I think, uh, what was your thing, Jeff, though, sir? Oh, Robert. Robert. Um, that whole mindset of that, yeah, you're probably still calling yourself a PMO, but you're really acting as a coaching entity within the organization to help enable them step away once they're getting into that high performing state and maybe touch back in every couple of months and help nudge them to a little bit higher performing state. Right. That seems to be like a good place for a PMO shared of where it's going to go. Here's a great place where you're going to go. Yeah. I started working with projects now, which is something like I started the program. It started actually with your definition. And it's government contracts, and we have people going back and forth. And now we have this, um, we now have this framework where all the teams are working together, very minimal contact with the PMO, other than if they help us with the uh, strategic vision. Um, we work with teams and figure out, okay, what, what does it make sense, what to do uh, in order to priority. Uh, so the definition, yeah, we still call it PMO. I think a lot of the work that they used to do, which they were horrible at, got pushed out or pushed out. Um, maybe you know, maybe we should call it PM one more, maybe we should call it. Right, I think we should call it PM one demand. <laughs> but uh, but they're the ones who get the money for us and they're the ones who, you know, help to uh, keep it coming and, and make making sure we're delivering uh, the right thing. Sure. The, the the new some of the new foundations on scale and for example, I think the focus of the PMO is now one least trained engineer is what you're sort of seeing. Those people that are managing the least trained are, are folks that play a formal role in the PMO. They're now managing those values. Yeah, to your point, our, our PMO now mostly is uh, getting the money at communications. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the team, the development team, the IT team, so far. Um, you know, we've all been doing the work. 
Yeah. Um, I work in a highly regulated environment, and once in a while, Congress comes down and says, you know, hey, what the hell are you guys doing? Uh, we want somebody to come up here and explain everything to us and tell us what's going on. And so we need to have, I mean, I understand that Agile yeah. completely. I work in an empty environment. Um, but you need to have somebody who's going to go up and sit at a hearing and explain what's happening. So there's always sort of that tug and pull back and forth. But when you're working in a government environment, there's just no avoiding a certain amount of centralization or responsibility or at least accountability. And so I think some of what we're talking about has to do with that. As, you know, when the rubber hits the road and the GAO comes in and audits and gets all angry, then somebody's got to go explain what's going on. And it's probably going to be somebody from, you know, related to the CMO. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but uh, you know, there are a lot of people. I'll, I'll caution you. But I will say that I would caution you to uh, not rely on Agile elements because I know a lot of people would say I've never seen an Agile project that really any value. There are a lot of people who told me that. Obviously, they're wrong. We all know that. But the point is that people will see things and they're going to be like, well, it's us. And you know, so you can't always just go on like with that kind of involved evidence. But you need an organization or something, an entity that basically promote Agile values, promote automation, promote metrics, uh, get people trained, have accountability outside the organization. Things like that, you need something there to do that. If you want to call it a PMO or whatever, it's up to you. But I, I do see value in that kind of thing. If it's done well, just like, I've seen Apple done badly, and then someone can say, well, Apple sucks. But no, it's just that it's done badly. It wasn't done the right way. Yeah. So just be aware that seeing something done <coughs> wrong a few times doesn't mean it's incapable of being done right. Yeah. You know, if you, if you talk in terms of ideals, uh, what, what would be the ideal scene, um, to, to your original point? For me, it would be that whether it's achievable organically or not. I have some question about whether that's ever going to be totally the case, because it would still depend on some infrastructure, I think, is you need vision, direction, and you need information flow. You need an infrastructure to achieve that, right, for measurement. You really, really need those. And as you're talking, a hypothesis occurred to me that if we just talk about what we all agree about, it seems like, I don't mean to speak for all of us, but <laughs> uh, are the really bad things about a PMO as they've been executed to date? Um, it would almost be an interesting study. I, I would speculate that the, the amount of PMO bad behavior is directly proportional to the lack of vision in the company. I just thought of that, but I bet if you check that out, I bet you find that to be true. So, so that's interesting. The, uh, the, I think it's a GAO report on uh, healthcare.gov. Mm -hmm. I, I think the way they described it, it moved from, well, it's a continuum, I forget it jumped on that chart, the, uh, you had that top of authoritarian, I forget, uh, regime where they're telling, dictating, here's what you should do. For example, one of the things they told the contract was, you shall use mark logic. And that's not what they bid, or maybe they bid it for just a small part. The contractor protested and said, we don't have the people, and furthermore, it's kind of hard to find the people who know what Mark logic is, who know a skill database. And that was one of the key reasons for the, uh, for the failure. And what fixed it was when it moved to the other part of the continuum, where they had this more collaborative team to kind of dive in, figure out what, what, what they needed to get done, what minimal set of uh, capabilities to, to get out there, so people start using the sites and start building from there. Right. And that's when they started seeing success. But they had a clear purpose to get something up that people could register on. Right. Yeah. Versus let's boil the ocean. Right. Yeah. And I think that's that clear thing. direction being directly proportional to the dysfunction of a PMO, yeah, I, that's, that's that's resonate with me. Yeah. yeah. I might have gotten that wrong, but basically mm -hmm. if real deep dysfunctional, they probably lack no purpose, no vision. High purpose, high vision, very highly functional. Makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, I haven't studied the scaling frameworks for larger agile efforts, but um, it, it may 
maybe there's an entity in the that does this, but as a you know, as, as a manager of any level up in the organization, I would think I'd, I'd be hoping that I'd have an organization that helps me do the things you were talking about, helps me measure value, helps me prioritize assets and projects, um, because decisions do need to be made. So, I mean, somebody has to do that. Can can which team does that in, in, in the university y'all are talking about? Does it have 200 projects? So the, uh, I mean, where I've seen PMOs, this is not Agile, but where I've seen uh, PMO type organizations go in and be extraordinarily engaged, um, have been in places, you know, <coughs> been digging out of messes. So the, uh, you know, I've seen, uh, I think it was DOD Healthcare, where they had overlapping systems, and a couple hundred to 300 overlapping systems, and they needed to put a sense behind the logic of what they continued and what they didn't. Mm. Um, I, you know, I just I don't know how you do that without some organization. So maybe maybe what you said about PMO on demand is an ideal state. Maybe you don't need it, or maybe or maybe you need some other name of an agile organization. But you certainly, you know, unfortunately we live in the real world. You know, yeah, we get into debt, and we you know even though we're in the ideal world, we don't need financial advisors. <laughs> um, you know, in the real world, maybe you do need to go talk to somebody and. And, and have them give you a route for yeah. particular issues. And that's what I think I'd be hoping that the organization uh, that I sponsored and built in, inside of my agency or whatever would be helping me do. Yeah, it's certainly, did somebody raise your hand here? So I was, I was just yeah. gonna say, I think I've seen both sides where, I've seen PMOs where they looked at Agile as a way that someone's gonna swoop in and take over their power over the organization and how things were going to be done. And so they were going to mandate to whoever was going to end up being the Scrum Master, this is how things shall happen. Uh, and then I've seen other PMOs, which I'm lucky to work in one that works okay at least, where they focus a lot more on what resources really need to go where in order to make this team effective. So I was the Scrum Master for one team. They felt immature enough where I could be taken off of that team. They could get someone else to backfill me and move me to another team that needed a full-time Scrum Master. And so they were able to look at that view from the whole section, look at what teams need which resources right now. Yeah. And certainly we, we work in the real world, so their organizations are at different cultural levels, right? So you're not going to go into every organization and say, OK, let's innovate. You know? Go forth and produce. Yes, ma'am. And just to get back to your Napoleon example, um, Napoleon still had a central staff, I assume, <laughs> that then, you know, marshaled out the, um, here's our objective and here's your piece. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. As you can see, we, even with an Agile PMO, sometimes you can fail <laughs> in the end. But there are other reasons for that. Okay, well, thank you very much. Right. I would like to uh, bestow the honors upon you to pick a name for the hat to, or well, that's not a hat. Could be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it could be. But we've Let's got Lisa not. Atkins' book signed by Lisa Atkins herself. Mm -hmm. So, uh, set up <laughs> one. You can pick one out. All right. I should say name on the other side. Oh no, no name. Uh oh. Oh dear. Number uh, 8769. Oh, there we go. 8769. Last four digits, 8769. All right. Yes, sir. Nope, 8769. 8769. You got it. Hey! Hey! Yeah, yeah, fine. Thank you very much. I have high trust here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And for your... Uh, That's what we do. We give away gifts. Yes, and here's yours. Oh, thank you. So uh, thank you for uh, presenting tonight, Art, and uh, we we'll look forward to uh, hearing more from you in the future. Absolutely. So, Thanks, guys. Thank you all again for coming out.
And if you can, please grab your drinks and bottles and throw them in the recycling bin. Uh, that would be most helpful. And also, these black chairs, we can actually stack those up. Also helpful. But thanks again. It's going to be a whole other month before we meet again. We're going to sit by the <laughs> Oh, thank you. I have a book to share with you. Oh, yeah. It was Facebook. And uh, we went back to the university today to contrast some books.